Welcome again to Science Thursday. I'm going to hold this a little further from me. Uh, I wanted to uh, introduce our guest speaker, Jim Moulton. Um, Jim started martial arts training at the age of 16, and he holds a fifth degree black belt in Korean Kung Fu. So if any of you get out of line, I will stick him on you. <laughs> uh, his initial martial arts training involved into the study of other disciplines, including Bagua Zhang, that I pronounced that That's correctly. close enough, sure. Uh, tai Chi and uh, Qigong. So he's been training, studying, and teaching these arts for over 40 years and is a recognized expert in Asian bodywork therapies, including acupuncture, tai chi, and medical qigong. And he specializes in teaching exercises to improve chronic conditions for people of all ages, but particularly for senior citizens. So he's worked with Parkinson's disease patients through the Florida hospital and continued giving lectures with the hospital through its Advent Health Program and the Winter Park Wellness Center, among other venues. He's co-authored a book and produced numerous journals and graphic charts and study guides, guys, and he has a number of them up on the table that you can look at after the, uh, after the meeting. Uh, he also has a lot of YouTube videos on martial arts, fitness, self-improvement, health and well-being, and health and well-being exercises. But he does have a YouTube channel, and this uh, lecture will be up on that YouTube channel, and I think we'll also try to get it on the University Club channel. So he's currently pursuing a bachelor's degree in wellness and alternative medicine, and in his spare time, he started teaching Tai Chi here at the club last year. So if any of you made any New Year's resolutions to improve your health, I can think of no better way to do it than to join our classes, which are here every Thursday at 11.30. There's a small fee of $10 class for the lessons, and I can attest that they are well worth it. And he does offer discounts for a class that's paid in advance. So I do hope to see some of you there in the coming weeks. But in the meantime, he's going to be here to help us all relieve some of our aches and pains through the medically validated practice of acupressure. So let's give him a warm university club welcome. Thank you. So can everybody hear? You got the microphones on. You got a video that's uh, going to record a video camera so that people that are not here can follow up on it. So I got a box of golf balls up here. I think I need to be careful not to speak too loud. Um, I hate golf. I live on a golf course, but I collect golf balls because they hit my house and end up in the patio and you know, consequently in the pool. So why do they bring a box of these golf balls? Because they got little dimples on them. And part of what we do, what we're going to do, acupressure is kind of like self-massage, you know, reflexology. Some of you might be familiar with that. And uh, little dimpled golf balls you can actually use to help massage the points in your hand or you slip your shoes off and you can roll the, the golf ball into your foot and hit some of the sensitive spots. So uh, anyway, thought some of you might have noticed some of the graphics and the books and stuff up here. I just thought I'd spread that out so it kind of gives you an idea what the spectrum of, uh, of what we can, we can go over. So I am not working from a script. I don't have a, an agenda of, you know, okay, I got to do this, this, and this, and this. So what I was hoping to do is give you a little bit of a uh, explanation of the theory behind what acupressure and acupuncture are so that you have a better um, con grasping of the concept of what we're trying to accomplish. So if you look up at this screen here, I'm not going to do a whole lot of the uh, lecture from the, the screen. It's just going to be like something there to kind of help uh, visualize a point of what, what I'm going to talk about. So you can see that this is kind of a figure that I drew up with my, my fancy software program that there's meridians or lines. They look like wires that run throughout the body. So I don't know how many of you are interested in all the medical stuff and the anatomy and physiology. I have some, some depth with that, but don't want to go too far in one direction with it, but just enough to kind of give you a taste of, of why this stuff works. So how many of you have taken uh, treatments for acupuncture? They give you a little needle and sits in your skin for a bit. Acupuncture, right? That's the needle. Have any of you done acupressure before? Reflexology. Some of you heard of reflexology. It's kind of the same idea. So um, can you scroll down a couple pages? Just try to go further to a graphic. This is a, a book that I'm working on that actually gets into a lot of the detail, the concepts and theories. Oh, that's a good one. So again, you're not going to be able to see all the details, how far away you're sitting, but um, Acupuncture is part of traditional Chinese medicine that goes back probably about 3000 BC. They figured this out a very long time ago, how the energy moves in the body. 
So this is some ancient artwork. And if you can see to the right there, some of those little images that look like little uh, lines, that, those were like bones from fish or from some small animals like birds. And they would use that as the acupuncture needle. So can you keep scrolling a little bit further down? This, that's a good one too. So how does this stuff work? Uh, everybody's probably familiar these days with the placebo effect because it's so relative to what's going on in our culture and our society right now. It's like, oh, this thing works or this thing doesn't work. Well, a lot of traditional Chinese medicine probably uses the concept of the placebo effect. Your mind is such a powerful tool. And the power of suggestion is so strong, you can heal yourself or you can make yourself sick too. It works both ways. Hmm, the door's open. I feel kind of cold. I'm kind of chilled. Hmm. Any of you feel chilled too? You know, just by me suggesting it, sometimes we'll make that happen where well, I wasn't feeling cold a second ago, but now that you think about it, I feel a little bit chilly. So we, we can do all this stuff where it's like, you know, you take this medicine, that medicine, it makes you feel good or it doesn't work for you. Well, guess what? You and your thoughts do affect your endocrine system, your cardiovascular system, and your nervous system. So that's what those little graphics, you know, showing you those different parts of the body. So if I tell you that we're going to sit back and we're going to turn on the news and watch three hours worth of CNN and some other political stuff, you're probably going to start getting sick to your stomach or angry because that's not what you came here for today. But just the thought, just the suggestion enters into your, you know, into your eyes, into your hearing, into your thought pattern, and right away your heart starts beating a little faster. You're like, oh, this is just garbage. I don't want to do this. So if you can do that, you can turn the TV off too. And then it goes away. Well, we can go the other direction. So the reason I'm bringing this up, it's, it's you know, people don't always think that this stuff works because they try it once or twice, or they know somebody that tried it and it didn't work for them. So right away they have a negative thought that it's not going to work for them. Well, our pharmaceutical companies rely upon the placebo effect to work. One person takes the medicine, it doesn't help them. Another person takes it, it works great. There's somewhere between 10% and 90% of the efficacy of prescriptions that rely upon the placebo effect. So if somebody comes in the room and they're a doctor and they got their white coat on, oh, I'm going to believe this guy. He's confident. He's got a stethoscope. He's got glasses on. He's clean shaven. All of those things make the person think this guy knows his stuff. So when they get the prescription, they're already thinking it's going to work for them. It goes the other way. If I was here and I had on a concert t-shirt that was all in tatters and said Led Zeppelin across it and I had flip-flops on, you'd probably be second guessing like, who the heck is this guy going to talk about this stuff? So anyway, the power of suggestion is a very strong thing. And if you look at the little graphic again, how do we affect our nervous system? It's by what input we put into our eyes, what we hear, and how that manifests itself with the chemistry of our body. So that's how come acupuncture does work. Kind of cut into the chase, right? If you understand the concept of getting a massage, someone's massaging your hands, massaging your neck, massaging your back, that feels good. Why? Because they're increasing the heat that's created by friction, which helps the circulation. And then the muscles relax, and it feels good. So at the very basic level, if you agree that massage is good, acupuncture, acupressure are probably even better yet because they're a little bit more fine, a little more acute towards whatever the issue is. Whereas a massage is kind of like, you know, your whole body gets work, they work on your neck, then they go to your shoulders. You personally can take control of something that's bothering you, like, oh, I feel real stressed out. Let's do some hand massage. Or I feel a headache, I can massage parts of my face. Tension in my neck, I can massage parts of my neck. Having a hard time sleep, I can massage my calves. But you can be in control of it. So how much of it are you going to learn today? I don't know. We'll see how far we get. If you guys start asking questions and um, pursuing like some of the stuff, like what the heck is that stuff, Jim? I got a question on that. Then it's going to take us maybe over this direction. If I just start showing you stuff, then we're going to go this direction. But then you'll start, probably start having some questions when we go that way too. So does this stuff all make sense? Does anything I'm saying not make sense? <sighs> I got to take a break for a second. Take a deep breath. <sighs> because why? Because I am in charge of my nervous system. If I can see that I'm starting to get a little fast, got to take a deep breath, slow it down. And then that helps me bring my focus back to what the topic is. Can you go on to one of the next slides? Not going to do a whole bunch of these, but there is some theories and studies that are out there that these meridians that we're talking about, they're, they're not the nerves, 
They're not the muscles. They're not, not the veins and arteries. So, so how does this energy travel through our body? Well, on the very basic level, every cell in our body has an electrical charge, negative and positive. And that's how the nervous system works to get us to move our hands and our feet and our, you know, our whole body. So there is electricity that's in our body. The meridians are kind of like a printed circuit board, if you would. We're a giant printed circuit board. So some of these theories and studies I'm talking about think that the way that the energy travels is through the fascia tissue, the connective tissue. Like when you uh, cooking a steak at home and there's the fatty tissue and then there's the stuff that's kind of like gray and kind of stretchy, that tissue is all throughout the body. So the theory is that the electricity might be traveling more through that. That's more conductive than the, the muscles and the bones are. So let's go on. Can you go on to one of the next slides? We're not going to do a whole bunch of these. I just wanted to give you an idea. So this is a picture of the acup uh, acupuncture needle that goes down. It only goes down into the skin about uh, anywhere from 0.5 to 4 millimeters. That's very little. That's with the needle. So the needle's a little bit sharp, right? And that's why you feel it. When we do it, it's not going to be nearly as sharp because you're using the, the thumb or your fingers and the pads of them. Occasionally, you'll use the, the nail, and that'll make it a little sharper, but it's still not going to feel like the needle. Can you continue? Ah, so this kind of just gives a, a visual of the, the needle at the bottom and how it affects maybe the, uh, the fascia tissue, which is connected into with the nervous system. It goes up the spinal cord, goes up to the brain. And the brain processes that either to relieve pain or to promote the healing response. Can you continue? And that's just the, kind of like a magnified picture of the thumb doing the same thing. Instead of the needle, the thumb is able to apply the same amount of pressure. But again, not, not as sharp. So I know sometimes people have fear of needles. Gosh, everybody talks about needles today. Everywhere you go, needles, vaccine needles, right? You want me to go to an acupuncturist? They're going to stick more needles in me? No, it doesn't hurt that much. They don't go so deep. Nope, not going to do it. Okay, fine. How about your thumb or your finger? Can that work? It's like, yeah, I'm not going to hurt myself, I'm not going to feel like I'm poking myself with a needle, right? Can we continue? You're doing a great job here for me. <clears throat> so these are just a couple other uh, options that are kind of in the same family with, uh, with acupuncture. You have acupuncture, the needle, acupressure, and reflexology is the thumbs and the fingers to massage different parts of the body. You have moxibustion, which is like you're putting a, a piece of herb or, you know, like a root or leaves, if you would, that type of thing and it would be put on one of those meridians or two or three meridians, and it would be heated. They catch it on fire a little bit, so it's like a, uh, almost like a cigarette, if you would, burning, and then the heat from that <clears throat> on the meridian increases the blood flow, and that you know, can help the whole body. And then, of course, there's Tai Chi and Qigong, which are the classes that I teach here, and then there's cupping, where they would take a, uh, like a light bulb type glass or a small cup, they suck the air out of it and they put it on the skin. And again, it does the same thing. By drawing attention to that area, the circulation increases with the blood flow. Um, can you continue further? Let's see if we got any other good stuff. If you can keep going. So I got some time on my hands when it comes to putting together some of these books and stuff. That's why I kind of gave an array of stuff that you can see that I've been working on. Can you keep going? Okay, I think we're at a point where it's just kind of maybe good to switch gears now. You don't want to look at 200 pages of, of gobbledygook and graphics. So does anybody have any questions up until now? Everybody's doing wonderful. So say you come in here and you're feeling kind of lethargic. You know, maybe you forgot to eat lunch today and you raced over here. And you're feeling, you know, I could almost take a nap right now. But, I don't know, if, I'll, if, I, if I sit down, maybe I'm going to fall asleep. Maybe you even feel a little bit faint. So what can you do? What are you going to do? You feel faint. Well, for one thing, you shouldn't be standing. You should probably grab a seat, right? So that your center of gravity is lower in case you were to fall over and faint, right? But you could do this. So you're not going to be able to see this really close. So I got to do a really good job of explaining it. I don't have any graphics on the screen to show you my thumb. But say you could take your thumb and at the sides of it, with your other finger, you're going to use your, uh, say your stronger hand, if you would, like pinchers. Your index finger and your thumb, you're going to push at the very base of your thumb, but on the sides, the very base of the cuticle, I'm sorry. And if you were to pinch that, I don't know if you can see my fingertips are actually changing color. My fingertips on the pinching hand and my fingertip on the thumb. 
So right there, it tells you that the blood's being kind of restricted. Some of you might not um, see the color change as much. I'm pretty fair skinned, so you can see how my fingertips are turning red. So with me pinching, this hand actually starts to get a little exercise where it's gonna get stronger from pinching. This other side, I just relax and pinch. So I'm gonna do my thumb, and not only do I pinch, but I'm gonna kinda twist it a little bit. And that should feel a little annoying. It should be, ah, that, that's a little sharp. If I come over there and grab one of your thumbs, it'll hurt even more. So you do it on your own. So then I'm gonna do the same thing on the next finger. At the base of the cuticle, on the sides, pinch. So I'm starting to use my nails now to make it a little sharper. So that's gonna wake me up. So again, if I was a little lethargic or I was feeling faint, I could do this. I could go off and sit down or go up against the wall and I keep working my way to the next finger. And I pinch and twist. Fingers turn red at the tips. And then I go on to the next one. Do each one maybe about five times. Each one of the fingers is connected to a meridian that, it goes, that attaches towards your lungs. Again, it's not like a vein or a nerve where there's a direct connection, it's energy. It's like electricity in the wall. You can't see it, but it's there. You know when you get the shock. With this, I can pinch. It's like you can't see that, there, you know, can't see really what's going on inside my body. But when I pinch, I can see the fingertip change color and I can, I can feel that little pinching sensation. It's like, ah, a little bit irritating. So I make my way through one hand, then I do the other side because they run on both sides. So your thumb, the thumb has a meridian that goes to your lungs. Your index finger has a meridian that goes to your large intestine. Your middle finger goes to the pericardium, the sac that protects your, your heart. Um, also, let's see, the next finger, they call that the uh, triple warmer, and that affects your breathing, your uh, digestion, and your elimination. So it kind of connects all those areas together. The next one's your pinky finger, and that connects to your heart. And on the outside of your pinky finger is the small intestine. So that's just on the hands. Then each of the toes, those connect by the other organs. So you would have done both hands. And by the end of that, you might feel like you're a little more alert, a little more awake, maybe not as lethargic. So that's one spot to kind of wake you up. Another way of doing this would be to take the spot between your nose and your lip. That spot, um, what's it called, the filtrum, I think? Fitrum, filtrum. That spot right there is the same spot that is used for self-defense. If you were to strike somebody there with your fingertips real hard or a punch, that would probably knock them out. We don't want to knock anybody out. This isn't a self-defense class. This is um, acupressure for, for health and the benefits from it. So if you were feeling a little bit faint, you would touch that spot, pushing in and going sideways, kind of like you're brushing your teeth. And then you could even go up a little bit on an angle, up and back, and that should feel a bit more uncomfortable. So I have used these last two techniques that I showed you quite a few times over the years. I'd have people come into the martial arts school that I own, and they thought they were in really great shape, and five minutes into doing some exercises and stuff, they're ready to fall asleep or pass out. So I would end up pinching their fingers, and they'd wake up a second or two later, go, what are you doing to my fingers? That hurts. I'm, I'm successful in what I, was, what I had to do in waking them back up. But I've also used this, um, I was telling, one of our guests here today, my mother a few years back was uh, at the hospital. We were all at the hospital taking my father in for open heart surgery. And as soon as he went through the doors, the surgery doors, and they closed, my mother just collapsed. And I was standing right next to her and I grabbed her arm and I've built up quite a bit of strength in my hands over the years from doing a lot of this stuff, the massage and uh, you know, martial arts. So I pinched her and grabbed her. Her whole body went limp, but I still kept her from hitting, hitting the floor. So then I knelt down next to her. My sister, who's a, a bit older than me, she doesn't know how I was doing this stuff and how involved it was. She's just like, she got her mouth hanging open and she's just like, what are you doing? So I'm massaging my mother's fingertips and then I started to massage this part right here. And within about 30 seconds or so, she's you know, alert and oh, what happened, what happened? Like you fainted. So I have, you know, I've used these things over the years, they do work. Um, Where's Pamela or Deborah? You guys were at one of my classes, I think, a couple months back. One of the people in my class, we were doing the Tai Chi class, and she started to do this, you know, where she was kind of like 
swaying a little bit. So everybody was to the back of me, and there like, I don't know, five to ten people in the classroom. And I just happened to look and glance, and I saw that. So I went over and I asked her if she was okay. And she's like, oh, I'm feeling a little faint. So I had her sit down right away, and I started massaging her fingertips. Didn't, I don't know if I did this one on her. If I did, I asked her, I go, do you mind if I touch, touch your face? And then within, again, you know, about 30 seconds or so, she seemed like she was fine. So anyway, that's a very good one for fainting, fingertips, and the spot between the nose and the lip. If they're fainting, lack of energy, if you find yourself standing, people often stand, you know, you're standing and your knees are locked and the circulation starts to pool in the lower part of your body, draining from your head. You feel like, oh, I've been standing for a while. Kind of go off to the side, bend your knees, massage your lip a little bit, play with your fingers, nobody would be the wiser. And here you are you know, helping yourself feel a little bit better. So let's continue. If nobody has, anybody have questions on any of that type of stuff? Yes. Yep. Yep. So, can you continue to go through some of the slides? Yeah, just keep going. There's a bunch of diff um, That's not going to have it. If it is, it's far back in there. So, I don't know if any of you saw this little flyer that I had with it. So you got the hand, and you got the feet, and then there's also your ear. So with the hands and feet, different cultures kind of had their own systems with it. So traditional Chinese medicine went with the pattern that I gave you. Um, the hand, this one, you know, it's going to be too small for you to see again, but the Chinese and the Korean, they each had their own version of it. And then the Japanese did a lot more with the foot. You know, shiatsu massage, I don't know if you've heard of that. You know, there's other, other types with with different cultures gravitated towards different explanations and different points meant different things for them. So what did I do? I studied all of this to some, some degree over the years to try to figure out well, which one is right. They're not, they're not all right and they're not all wrong. They're different presentations of the same stuff, which is how to get the energy moving. So your ears, when I was young, this was a bad thing. If I got in trouble or something, my mother would probably pinch my ear. That's not so acceptable these days. That's, you know, child abuse. And crazy, right? Some of you are probably the ones that were doing that, right? Pulling someone by their ear to get their attention, and make, them, make them follow whatever they're supposed to be doing. So your ears have your whole body. You know, you want to pass this around. These are maps of how the whole body is connected to your ears. So say you got a headache, congestion. You can take your earlobes and pinch them and kind of pinch and roll. You have to generate enough discomfort. It can't just be like a gentle massage. It has to be where you generate enough discomfort that the nervous system says, hey, that hurts a little bit. Stop that. Then the chemical reactions start to occur in your body that are basically being fooled into thinking that you're needing to um, heal something or to change something, right? So base of the ears. If you follow the spine of your ear all the way up to the very top, very top of your ears is the bottom of the body, more towards like the tailbone. Again, if you pass that over one of the other tables when you get a chance. So the bottom is actually the top. Top of your ears is more of the bottom. Inner parts of your ears are the inner parts of your body. So I've gone to uh, my acupuncturist over the years, and they would use seeds. They'd put these little seeds that are like under a piece of adhesive, like a Band-Aid, and they'd put them on the ear, and they would pinch it. And that little seed would hit that acupressure point even more, and it would, it would be disturbing. Like, ah, it hurts. And they're like, okay, you got to do that three times a day for the next three days. Every time you got a headache, pinch that spot. Or for the... Uh, the sinuses, the sinuses were actually more closer into the hole, the, the opening. So then back problems were, again, kind of towards the top of the ear. So what you can do, if you're feeling just a little tired or lethargic, massage the whole ear. You don't need to know all these specific spots. You can do the whole ear. So if you sit here and do this for about a minute, top to bottom, inside and out, front and back, your ears are going to get very warm and you probably feel a lot more awake. So that's a good technique you know, for those type of things. Does anybody have a question on 
Again, any of this stuff or anything specific? Headaches, we can do simple ones. Can you grab that and pass it over? And then we can get a little more involved with it. A very simple one to help for a headache is if you stretch your thumb and your index finger away from one another and then follow the bone that goes from your index finger all the way to the base, pushing in. This spot right here is where the lung meridian and the large intestine have some kind of convergence around this area. And we're gonna pinch in. Take a deep breath, breathe out, release the pressure. And do about five of those. So again, I can use my thumbnail, I can use my index finger, pushing down. That direction is where it should feel a little more sharp and acute. Push it, take a deep breath, release your breath. Release the grip. So again, there's two parts. One is your hand getting stronger from doing it. I don't know if any of you have met a massage therapist before, people that do body work. Their hands are pretty strong. Their legs are pretty stiff. Their backs are pretty stiff because they're doing this motion sometimes where they're on their feet all day long. Their hands get incredibly strong, their shoulders, but also they start to lose some flexibility in those areas because that's the main, main motion that they do. So when we're doing it, I'm trying to pinch with one hand, that hand's gonna get stronger. The other hand I want it to be as relaxed as possible. Why relaxed? So that the blood flows more and the energy flows more. So that's a simple one. You do it like about five times, gotta do the deep breath. Why the deep breath? Because again, that helps the nervous system relax. When the nervous system is more relaxed, there's more blood flow throughout the body. So if we wanna get a little more complicated, there's a series, um, there's a second PDF file. Can you see the second one? It was in the same um, folder that was open. Okay, go to the top in the second tab to the right at the very top on the left hand side. Can you see that? There we go. Can you page down a bit? There's 12 meridians throughout the body, by the way. 12 main, main meridians. And then there's another series of eight. So these are some uh, points for, oh, that's the one I want. Go back right there. So hopefully that's a little bit bigger detail. So this is how we would um, start to work on if you have stress. From stress, we get headaches. From headaches, you get pain. Further from that, you might have um, faintness or unconsciousness. So there's about 18 of the points in the sequence. I'm gonna do like the first seven or eight maybe, and those are the ones that are mostly for stress and headaches. So the first one is the point in between the nose and lip like we just did. So again, I'm massaging kind of like I'm brushing my teeth, side to side, and then up on an angle. And as much as you can when you're doing these, you try to do deep breathing. If you're all tense and you're thinking it's not gonna work and you're scrubbing like you're really brushing your teeth with the thought of getting all the enamel off, probably not gonna do as much benefit for you. But if you're a bit more relaxed, the pressure is there on my hand, but I'm relaxed and I'm breathing very deep in through the nose, out through the nose, or yeah, that's the best way, in through the nose, out through the mouth works too. So that's the first one. Number two is we go up to our bridge of our nose and right about where the eyebrow comes to an end, we go up and down. So the, there's different directions because different nerves or the pressure points or the meridians at different angles, our body protects itself. So I don't know if you've ever walked into a chair and it hit you and you know, whacked you in the leg and it, it kind of hurt, right? Okay, it hurts. But then another time you hit something and it's almost the same spot, but it hit you on an angle and it brought you down to your knees. Like, holy cow, that really hurt. So like with this one here, this goes side to side and then up. The one next to your eyebrow, we go up and down because that is more acute or more precise to stimulate that, that, that spot. So then the next one, number three is center of your pupil where it comes onto the ridge of the eye socket. We go side to side on that one. It might even feel like a little bump. 
So if you could see a skeletal, you know, a skeleton uh, without, you know, flesh and everything, you got the eye socket. Directly above where the pupil would be, there's a little bump in the bone right there. So again, we go kind of sideways. And as you do a couple of these, you can tell, you can feel, it's like, oh, when I get tension, I get a headache, this, this is a spot I might just instinctively kind of massage parts of my head. Which brings me to the next one, number four, is your temples. Right underneath where your glasses might be, that piece of the glass, your eyeglasses is called the temple. That soft spot near the corner of your eye and then behind it. That one we kind of roll in a circle. That's the one that I always come towards when I'm feeling a tension headache. And for some reason, it just feels so much better with it. So there's different types of headaches too. You have tension headaches, you have sinus headaches, migraine headaches. I've had, all, I've had unfortunately, the, I've experienced these all over the years. Some of these don't work for like migraines. For uh, sinus headaches, we also find the spot on the side of the nose, right, where the nostrils on the side, and you, you know, your sinuses are actually right below that, right? So it makes sense that massaging that area helps, helps to alleviate some of the pain. So that's a different, you know, type of headache. Yes? Yeah. Yeah. So that's why I kind of go back to the placebo effect and the massage. It's like you can look at it at different levels. If you want to know the, the anatomy and physiology end of it, it's like, oh, it, it, it does kind of line up. The sinuses are there. So if I'm massaging the sinuses, it's going to help relieve some of the pressure. But then to take it like to the next steps, like with you know, traditional Chinese medicine, that's, part of, that's the lung meridian or the uh, large intestine. So it's like, large intestine? What's that have to do with my, with my sinuses and getting headaches and congestion? Well, it's all connected together. You know, sometimes you feel like, uh, what's a good way to say the connection? You stub your toe. And you're walking around the house barefoot and you stub your toe. Well, if you like, keep favoring it for a while because your toe hurts so much, next thing you know, your knee's bothering you. It's like, my knee's bothering me, but I hurt my toe. And then a couple more days go by and your back starts bothering you because everything started to get shifted because your toe got injured. So it's kind of the same with you know, some of these other things. You get headaches, you get headaches a lot, well, that starts to affect the organs too. So sinus headache's different from a you know, migraine headache. Um, so let's keep going with these because there's a couple more of them that you'll maybe be surprised to feel. So the first one was here. Second one was by your eyebrow. Third one was directly above the pupil on the eye socket. Fourth one was temple. Fifth one, I believe it's below the left, that went away. Fifth, it doesn't matter too if they go in order, it's just knowing that there's a bunch of different ones to do. You go below your lip and there's a ridge where the flesh is and it's the same idea, like I'm brushing, like brushing my teeth, but this time I go down on an angle. And again, I do it enough to feel that, a little, that little bit of annoying pain. That's enough to stimulate the nervous system to say, hey, this area needs a little bit of help healing. So we got that one. Then we go to the top of our head. The very top of our head is where all the bones come together. When we were uh, an infant, there was an opening there. All the bones had to fill in together. Well, coincidentally, the energy, main energy, goes down the center of the body, through the legs, up the back, over the top of the head, and converges right here in the mouth. And that energy channel goes up and down with your, your mouth, with your tongue going up and down. So the very top of the head, we tap on it. Hello, anybody home? That one gets annoying. You tap it. Do it about 10 times. And you feel that little knocking inside your body. When you stop, it's like, oh, such a relief. That feels better now. So, so that's like, you know, you could do it in progression, like until it starts to feel a little bit better. Or if one is more than the other, sensitivity-wise, you would work on that one a little bit more. So I got a six. Um, some of the next, I don't remember the sequ sequence on all of them, so again, we'll just keep doing them. The base of your, your jaw, where the earlobe and the jaw come together, what do they call that, the TMJ, temple mandibular joint? Again, we're gonna kind of massage that because the, the, that joint has muscles, when you, you know, chew and swallow, that the muscles actually connect up into the skull. So when those muscles get tight from you having tension or sometimes misalignment with that, that joint, then you start getting headaches from it. So we're just massaging 
that joint and those muscles that hold that together to relieve some of that tension. So I like to do the breathing. You know, not that I'm going to stop breathing, but I like to focus on deep and slow, relaxed breathing as I'm doing any of these massage points. All right, so where's that get us? Somewhere around seven. Then we go back to the hands. And again, this is all connected to headaches and stress in the head. You find the base of your palm and you kind of slide towards the fingers. So it's like you're doing a uh, two inch slide maybe. And if you keep your hand tense, you know, there's muscles that cross across the palm, right? So if you keep it tense, it's not gonna relax as much those muscles. So I'm relaxing the fingers. Again, look at how red my fingertips are turning. So I come back to the base of the palm, and again, about two inches, I slide down, let the hand relax. So if you want to look at your hands like a, uh, not your hands, but your arteries, your nerves, the meridians, like a garden hose, when you want to turn on the water, there's a valve. The water comes flowing out. You turn the valve off, pressure builds up inside the house. So I'm manipulating the pressure flow and treating my hands like a valve by doing that pinching. All right. That's also good for stomach aches. The center of your palm has a connection to your stomach. So then the next one is coming back to the fingers. So I showed you how to pinch on the sides. We also have where you can pinch on the tip. The very tip. I used my nail and go right in the very tip. I'm not going to be able to exp uh, show you a bigger picture of that one, I don't think. And then we do the same thing on each finger. So we got the sides with the cuticle, and we also have where we can do the tip. And if you notice, I take my finger away. There's like a little divot that I left behind from pinching it. So again, I work my way to each of the fingers, doing about five deep breaths. So you're like, wow, you know, you're spending a lot of time deep breathing. You're spending a lot of time pinching. You're spending a lot of time relaxing. Well, sometimes that's what you need. Regardless if this stuff works, you're taking time, you're relaxing, you're putting some thought into your body, and maybe you'll feel better from it. So that's where it kind of comes back to that placebo effect of like, does this stuff really work? Does it have any scientific basis? I don't know. It, it does, but just for purpose of discussion, does it really matter if you're feeling better from doing it? If somebody gives you a back massage and you feel like you have less tension or less headaches, do you really need all the scientific information on it? it? It feels good. The results were achieved. So for our purposes, I think, you know, you can get a lot out of it from doing that. Um, let's do a couple other things for the tension in the next, because that that's really is, you know, a big thing that people have problems with. Yes, that? Right. It is. It is really good for tension and stress. Well, that's how, if I had different graphics, you, you can see there's muscles that are all underneath the skin. So the muscles, when you chew, you know, people sometimes clench their teeth. Um, you know, during the night, there's the grinding and all that stuff. You know, all that contributes to tightening of the muscles in your face and in the skull. So that's a very good one to, to loosen that up. So if you do these things one time, okay, I got a headache gym or I got tension, I'm gonna do this one time, I'll give you the benefit of the doubt. And then you do it one time and you really don't feel much from it and then you just put it up on the shelf and go, you know, I did that one time, it doesn't really work. You're probably not gonna get that much out of it. I started doing this when I was 16 and it was like in the martial arts atmosphere, if we injured somebody, we needed to know, we needed to know how to fix them. So you could knock them out, but you had to know how to wake them up. If we twisted somebody's wrist with like a, a keto or hop keto exercise, if we twisted their wrist and sprained their wrist, we needed to know the exercises to rehabilitate their wrist. Because that's the, uh, you know, the concepts of yin and yang. So you're familiar with that. There's equal balance. You know, you got like the two fish shape. It was probably in one of the graphics, you know, the, the yin yang shape. So there's always that balance. If we were going to learn how to hurt somebody, we need to know how to heal them. And that, that was kind of like the basis of all that stuff. Yes? Yep. So much of this stuff does have 
science, you know, there is science and research behind it. They're, you know, they're getting into the politics and the money and the resources and all that. A lot of it is very hard to quantify. So if I come over there and pinch your finger, it's gonna feel more probably than what you would do yourself. So in a study, how do you know? You know, you get some, it's a really good person as far as their hand strength and their grip and finding the right spot, and they're like whoop, really, really sharp and on it. Or it's somebody that's not as familiar with it and they're kind of new and they didn't really hit the spot right. So you didn't get the results from it. So you have your skepticism, plus you have the practitioner maybe not having whatever level of ability to make you feel like you got results from it. But if you look for it, there are some studies, you know, that are proving, you know, more and more of this stuff works. Yes? Are you gonna, are you gonna boo me? You said something, if, if you were bored, you were gonna boo or something, right? Are you accusing me? You lied to me. Well, you haven't, you haven't booed me yet, so I guess you're enjoying what I'm talking about, so. Sure. I played football in college. If I got hit or hurt, trainers would come and press the underarm area. No clue what they were doing. And then they would say, because I used to be a quarterback. Yep. I said, now move your arm forward. I could do it with no pressure. What's the underarm area? So let's just address the first part of what you said. Just the fact that they had you move your arm in a certain position and then maybe pressed and massage something, that's again, that's you know, uh, Western medicine, allopathic medicine, that the muscles are gonna move a certain way, they're gonna work. If they're not moving that way, they're not gonna work. There's discomfort, right? So at the very least, they got you moving it or pinched something to make it feel better. This guy was very Ah, so now when you start getting into... It's like asking for the Western part of the East. My question yep. is, they knew somehow how to press, and it was an area up here and in the underarm area. So that the can you page back and see further back? Further back? Ah, right there. So do you know how to? Can you zoom? There's a plus towards the top, middle. That'll work too. A little bit more. So I don't know if you can see that in any detail, but you got about three meridians that go through the shoulder area there. One being the lung, the pericardium, and uh, the stomach. So how does your stomach affect your shoulder? You know, this is how we look at it. You know, a lot of times, like in Western medicine in the United States, it's like, you're telling me that my shoulder hurts, but I need to worry about my stomach. It's nowhere connected whatsoever. Well, on an electrical level, it is. Because if you look at when you uh, blow out a fuse in your house or the breaker trips, in your bathroom, if you trip the breaker, there's gonna be other outlets in the house that probably aren't gonna work because they're all connected, the same circuits. So you don't get electrocuted when you're washing dishes and something you know, falls in the water or whatever. So for your situation, I don't know exactly what they touched or what they were doing, but that's why um, some parts of the body are affected by other parts without it really making sense. Well, you're knocking the wind out of your lungs and the diaphragm is collapsed and it takes a moment or two for that to relax. Yeah, so some of that, again, it might, just, it might be Western medicine's way of adjusting towards the muscles and how the diaphragm works with your breathing mechanism and that. Traditional Chinese medicine with the meridians might be overlapping but it's not necessarily, you know, the same thought in their mind, you know. If I get the wind knocked out of me, someone's not going to necessarily come up and probably what you would all do is, you know, pat my hand, rub my head, wake up, Jim, wake up, Jim. You know, someone knows this stuff, acupressure, they would come in and they massage my lip like in a, in a second or so and I'd be awake. So it's a different process trying to accomplish the same goals. Ah. To get somebody not to be nervous on the stand, you not only take a deep breath to expand the diaphragm, right. you go halfway up and then you add as many breaths, holding a breath, right. because that releases the forced tension. And that goes back to what I'm saying when you're doing this massage and the pinching and that, you got to breathe and relax the breaths with it. 
So they would also advise somebody put a tack in their shoe by their big toe so that when they got to a point that was stressful or they had to answer a question that they didn't want to answer honestly, they would push down that, that thumbtack on their big toe. And again, it's activating their nervous system to react to that pain down there instead of this pain here of what they had to do to answer the question. It's all the same idea with different methods of how to get there. It's OJ, OJ, says, OJ Simpson did that. He had like three or four tacks, I think, right? But it, the, the point I'm getting at, it's your nervous system. It's how you're dealing with the nervous system. Every thought that goes in your eyes to your brain, your body adjusts chemically to that. Every time you hear something, trickling water is relaxing. Car accelerating quickly and a, a muffler popping or whatever, that, that's harsh. So every, every type of input from our senses is constantly adjusting our nervous system. We do this stuff with the hands and the deep breathing and Tai Chi. It's just a different way how to circumvent or, or hack the nervous system. So how far did we get with that? We did the hands, we did more of the fingertips. The other ones that were on that chart that had the muscular views, they start to get more in depth into the underarms, the calves, there's some on the feet. They're, they're, you know, it starts to spread out through the body because after the headaches, the concept would be that there's possibly more stress that would cause um, faintness or unconsciousness. So, you know, if any of you have watched, you know, ER or some of these other television shows, Grey's Anatomy, it's like you learn a little bit of everything with their, their shows and the acting. But oftentimes someone comes in the hospital unconscious and they're wheeling them in, they might massage the sternum up and down the sternum where there's like no, no, no muscle, it's just the flesh. Well, that's a spot that's very, very sensitive and annoying, and oftentimes you'll wake up from being unconscious from that spot. But that's Western medicine. But it overlaps with traditional Chinese medicine because it's that meridian that I was talking about that goes up the center, front and back. So what else do we have? I got the golf ball. So we got about another 15 minutes of class. So again, if you have questions, please ask because it's easy to get off on another tangent with questions. Acupuncture usually is more effective in that it's more precise. It's like hitting, you want to hit a nail. You're going to use a sledgehammer or you're going to use a sponge. Which one's going to be more effective? Well, sponge is not going to do much, but you'll still, you know, hit it, right? I don't know if the sponge is the right idea, but you get the idea. The hammer is going to be hard. So, Many people will get more benefits from doing needles because of the sharpness of it and the acuteness that makes it more sensitive. But if they're not going to do it because they don't like needles, then acupressure, the hand massage, is the better way to go with it. So you had a question too? Back, lower back pain? Yes. Can you scroll up, or I'm sorry, to the next page? Keep going. You might have to zoom out. Well, no, let's keep going if you would. That spot right there, just stop real quick. If, if you have problems making it through the night, you wake up at certain times of the night, oftentimes it is associated with the different organ. I wake up at three o'clock in the morning a lot of times. So that's the liver and the lung. You need to get up and use the restroom sometimes. It's like clockwork, three o'clock, just wake up. Go use the restroom and come back. So if you find yourself doing that, there's charts on this where you can massage a particular part of the body and in time, not just doing it once, but over a series of days, weeks, months, you'll start to you know, alleviate that problem. Can you keep going? Looking for the, the lower back one. Oh, there we go. So at the very least, you can massage the area that you have discomfort, just direct. And that area, massage usually helps because again, you're getting the muscles to loosen up and you're getting blood flow to the area. Depending upon what kind of back issue, it could be pinched nerve from um, strain in the sciatic, getting pinched in between the vertebrae, um, it could be bruising from getting hit, it could be posture issues. One of my, my legs is a little bit shorter, so I have a little shim in there to make up the difference because that makes my posture off, which affects my back. So those are all different issues, but just pain. Um, the back of the knees, there's spots on the back side of the knee, and you can see it's kind of like towards the outside, and there's a tendon on both sides that's very pronounced, massaging those areas. 
the uh, fourth one over, the rear end, lower back by the sacrum, that area there. So again, if that's where you're feeling the discomfort, direct massage to those areas often does, does help. The feet, top of the foot by the big toe, in between the big toe and the little toe, halfway up. The spot on the hand, which I showed you already, that's headaches, but general pain, the, the one on the thumb or the uh, index finger. So those have a connection to your back, even though you're not touching your back. So then this other picture to the left bottom here shows the hand, that's a Korean, Korean system of how the, the spine lines up with your middle finger. From the middle finger, not that you're giving someone the middle finger, let's not go there, but from the top of the middle finger, that's the, the skull, all the way down to the base by your palm is the sacrum. So anything in between there, massaging that whole uh, channel basically does sometimes start to give you relief if you have you know, whatever the back issue is. Um, there's spots on the ear. Like I was saying earlier, the ear lobe is more towards the top of your head. The top of the ear is more towards the, the lower part of your torso. So if you can look in a mirror and find where that location is, there's like a shadow. I don't know if you can see where the lumbar points over to that red dot right there. That's a spot for lower back pain too. And I've used, I've used all these. I've done all these and to various degrees of results depending upon what the injury was. And, you know, with martial arts, we used to do a lot of silly stuff where you, you know, kind of get hurt or you're a little extra sore from doing stuff. So all of them have worked for me, some better than others. You used to be able to go to the drugstore and they had the little acupressure packages that I, that I was talking about, the seed, a little seed with the adhesive band-aid thing and you pinch it on your ear. You used to be able to go to the drugstore and they would have a pack of them, like five for $10 or so. And it was a little stainless steel ball and they were like pre-cut to whatever shape to hit like three points or two points or whatever at the same time. You put the little band-aid thing on your ear and then you would again massage it a couple times a day with the deep breathing. And then they did away with them. They discontinued it because there wasn't enough supply and demand for it. But I remember getting those for the back, which again is that spot I was just talking about. They had one for smoking, which is a different part of the ear, and then for neck pain, which again is a different part of the ear. The stuff is out there. You can probably find it still somewhere on Amazon or you know, somewhere on the internet. So we're starting to run out of time. So again, if you got questions, let's keep going. You had one? Yes, I have ACL or something? The side? Yeah. Pain? Yeah. Do you think I can do something until I get Massage directly. I wouldn't necessarily try to do something in my ear, you know, anything like that. Just massaging the area directly because you're starting to, again, increase the uh, circulation to that particular area, which more circulation means more healing. Ideally, I would suggest you try to do Tai Chi either before or after because that starts to give you some strength so that you're rehabilitating yourself. Oftentimes, I'll come across people or, you know, they got a back injury, knee injury, whatever injury, and they're like, Jim, I know you do this stuff, but what should I do? I'm like, do what I'm doing. And they're like, yeah, I don't know. I don't want to be so committed to it. And I'll go, you know, once you have surgery, they're going to make you do the same exercises that I'm telling you to do before you have your surgery. It's called rehabilitation, right? So I'm like, that's okay. I'll take my chances. I'm going to have the surgery. You know, five months later, or whatever, they come back and they go, my doctor said I needed to stop therapy and now I need to start doing something to make my body stronger. I'm like, it was the same stuff. But I would have had you doing it before so that going into surgery, you would be that much stronger or confident that your body's going to you know, be able to do well with it. So someone else over here? Oh, neck pain. Neck pain? Let's come back to that. I wanted to show a, a couple of the things we could do for that, but you've been trying to ask a question yeah, too. What's, the, what's your opinion of chiropractic as far as getting everything back in? Yes, I love my chiropractor. He used to be a student of mine. I totally agree with chiropractic. I don't necessarily agree in the practitioner of chiropractic. So depending upon who you get can make a very big difference. So I often teach with my class, there's this exercise we do at the beginning and the end, where I have everybody look up and to the left, stretching the neck and all the vertebrae and the muscles, and then down, and then up and to the right, and then down, and then straight up. And it's as much as you can do it. You know, you're not going to 
that's painful and sharp, you're not gonna do it, but you do as much as you can. That is very similar to the main chiropractic adjustment. When you go to a chiropractor, that they have you sitting down on the bed or laying flat or whatever, sometimes sitting up, and they turn your head and they tilt it up and then they, they manually do it, they forcefully do it. And it has a name, I can't remember it at the moment. High velocity adjustment or something or other. And that's the, the movement that turns people off from going to a chiropractor. And there are studies on it, you know, 30% of the people out of 100 did have some problems afterwards, and maybe one out of a million had a stroke from it because of that movement. So I've gone to my friend for lower back issues. He helped me find that my foot was a little longer, my leg was longer. He was able to adjust that. Um, now I don't need them. I just, you know, put the insert in my foot and do my exercises and I'm fine. So I would say if you can find the right chiropractor that will work with you where you can trust them and... I can trust him because he can trust me because I used to do all this martial arts stuff and knock him on the ground and stuff. So we have that kind of relationship. So I trust his opinion when it comes to, to stuff. He also taught me years back get a better pillow because the pillow I had for years, you know, they flatten. And it's like, well, why are you having neck problems? Well, you got to start looking at all these things. Are you sitting in the car with one arm up all the time, one arm up on the wheel? Do you have your wallet in your back pocket? you have a purse? You're always on the same side. Um, do I slouch? Do I favor one side? Well, I was sleeping on the same pillow for too long, and that was starting to give me neck, neck problems. So chiropractors, they, they have a wealth of knowledge if you get the right one. So you had a question about the neck and tension. So what we're going to do on this one, I'm going to massage at the base of my skull I don't have a good graphic that I can show you on this. The base of the skull, there's a, a bony protrusion there. I can't remember the names of all these. That's the occipital bone, I believe. Right below that, it's soft. Below the bone, it's soft. That spot right in there, you're gonna try to like work your finger in and kind of circle around, up and down, back and forth, not any specific directions. So that's like the first part of it. So when you're feeling a lot of tension in your neck, don't hold your head up. You can to get started. It lets the muscle relax. But then as you start to do it, let it drop a little bit. And now you feel the tension. Massage it a little bit. And you can come back, let it loosen up. And then let it stretch. So that's the first part. The next part, I'm going to take my hand like this. And starting... So again, at the base of the skull, it's bony but then I have the muscles that connect down into the neck as it goes downward. I'm gonna massage down. So say this is the back of my neck right here. I start at the top and I knead, like I'm kneading bread dough, and I keep going down, down. Okay, so that's the next part. And then you take your hand the bony side with your pinky finger down to the base. That bone at the base of your palm right there, that's kind of a strong spot. And again, if we saw the skeleton without all the flesh, it would be kind of like a little protrusion sticking out, a little bony protrusion, right? We take that spot, we go back to the base of the skull right there, right below that bump in the soft spot, and you just lightly do this like chopping motion. So there's this theory some of it's been proven, some of it hasn't again to go find the research. We can always find research on our opinion if that's what we're looking for. That's what's happening in the world out there. So if you want to look into these things, there's information out there. Percussion has an effect on our body. When you tap in a percussion type method, again, it's stimulating the nervous system that, hey, there's something going on there. The body reacts usually with a chemical reaction. The chemical reaction is usually to increase the blood or to relax the muscle tissue. So that percussion, while it hurts a little bit when I'm doing it, and it's annoying, when I stop, now it feels good. So the first one was massage. You can put an ice cube there too if you wanna try that sometime. If you're feeling like you got a headache, and again, just really feeling cruddy, you put an ice cube up to that spot right below there. And that does something different as far as stimulating that spot. And then the next one is massage down. And then I take my other hand and do the same thing. 
because four fingers on one side are going to be stronger than one thumb on, on one side. So I want to do both hands, both hands get stronger, and then both hands give me a good massage with it. And then the third part is chopping at the base, the base of your palm, base of your skull. You might even feel like your teeth are going to like, you know, lose my teeth, my eyes are going to bug out. No, that's too hard. Gentle. Got to add a little humor in there. Um, if you had a question too? What meridians, what organs are on the feet? Can you scroll back? Um, up. Up. Yeah. Okay, that's a good one too. So I brought these golf balls. If any of you want to stay after for a minute or two, because we are heading, you know, it's three o'clock. I could talk for another hour or two, no problem. But if you want to stay after, the feet, golf ball, rolling it around. Which spot? Well, again, we can figure it out. You can study the map, but really it's the spot that hurts the most. <laughs> That's where you need to do it the most. Wherever it's the most sensitive, towards the toes. Whoop, you got a golf ball. You, I said, I live on the golf course. I gotta give them away. That the toes are more towards the top, the head, the brain, sinuses, headaches, the toes. You work in towards the, the arch. The arch is more towards the organs. Does that make the heel? Where's the heel? Heel is lower back. So anyway, they're all different and contradicting in some ways and overlapping in others. So if you want to grab a golf ball on the way out, I've got a bu bucket of them here or a box of them. So that's one thing that will help. Just do that. Massage the feet. But your liver, where are we going? The spleen is your big toe. It's not going to be up there. Your spleen is your big toe. Your liver is on the big toe. The next toe over, I believe, is your stomach. You work your way farther down. You got the gallbladder and the liver. I already did the liver. The kidney is on the arch underneath here. So all of those organs, you got six on the feet connecting. You got six on the hands connecting. They're 12 meridians. 12 electrical connections like a printed circuit board. So a big part of what we do with the Tai Chi class, you come, you don't, either way, is there's this constant like pumping motion when we do the movements. You pump your, your ball or your foot and then you go to your heel. So this is exactly what I talked about a couple hours ago today at the class. Most time people, when they exercise, they don't exercise their fingers. Most people don't exercise their toes. What do they exercise? The big muscles, they get their legs moving, they get their arms moving, maybe they do some sit-ups with the intent to get the heart to beat faster or harder or stronger. And then when their fingers don't work as well, then they're like, oh, I got arthritis, I should take some medication. Why not exercise your hands so that they last longer? Same thing with your feet. When do people start exercising their toes? When they start having discomfort or they're finding they're not balancing and able to get around as well. So with the Tai Chi, that's what we work on. There's a lot of exercises that you, you get your fingers moving certain ways, your hands moving certain ways, and there's this constant pumping motion that keeps your toes involved in the game. Because when you start to lose flexibility, your toes and your feet and your ankles, it means you're not as mobile. You're not as mobile, more likely to fall. Not as likely to be exercising if you're not as mobile. Yep. Get them. I have used those in years past, and some of them are a little painful. And people would go, you know, oh, it hurts so much. Well, guess what? I have one of those and a pillow that goes with it. Those are sharp. The one I got is sharp. Yeah. Yep. But golf ball is a little, little sharp and it's hard. Tennis ball you can use on your shoulder, your back, your rear end, but you can adjust it. It's like, oh, 
Tennis ball's too easy. Try a golf ball. Or a, uh, lacrosse balls are real hard, but they're smooth. So all of this stuff works. The reason why people don't do it, come on. We are a lazy species. If I would have given this whole class and asked you all to stand, you would not have wanted to stay, right? So by nature, human natures, we do take the easier route. I got headaches, take an aspirin. I got headaches, do some face massage. Or exercise, you know, doing Tai Chi or deep breathing, Qigong or other, you know, options. You, you have the choice and, you know, your generation, you're a little older than I am, I think. I'm 57. You guys were, were you know, you guys had it going on. It's like, suck it up. Walk five miles to school, up and down hill both ways, right? Isn't that the story? In the rain, in the snow, right? So, you know, each generation, I think, has gotten a little bit weaker. And here we are today, and I think we're probably at the weakest. Okay, it's politics, it's philosophy, however you want to look at it. It, it is what it is, you know. I've taught my children a lot of this stuff, and they don't necessarily really, really see it like being a valuable thing right now. They kind of humor me a little bit. So that's why I did start writing books and doing graphics and stuff, because I'm not going to be here forever. But maybe someday they'll see, you know, my kids, they, they're pretty active. My kid's on the rowing team up at Syracuse, and my daughter, she you know, works out and does yoga and stuff. But they don't quite get this stuff. But they will. It's been around for 3,000 years. It's going to be around for another few at the very least. Just, I might not be here, you know. So I've been making books and all this stuff and try to get more of the word out. So. The older you get, the smarter you get. Yeah. So there's these, uh, so we have knowledge, hopefully, right? Hopefully we're smart, right? Book smart, you learn stuff. Okay, wonderful. Then you have experience. Over time, life experience and knowledge gets you to, hopefully, wisdom. We have a lot of people that are growing older, but they're not growing wiser. Okay? Just because you work somewhere for 20 years don't necessarily mean you have 20 years of continual experience. You've been doing the same thing each year. So oftentimes, here's where we're at as we get older. You know, people have been doing all this stuff, whatever. Well, if you're not learning as you're growing, when, when, when do you want it to stop? You know, I'm 57. I went back to school when my kids went back to school. Over the past years, I had taken college classes and certification and stuff. I did mostly this stuff, martial arts, and pursued learning about this stuff through the masters or through the teachers, not from the educational system. So they went back to school, everything went online. I said, well, I'm going to go online too. I'm going to fill in the blanks. So I have taken classes on traditional Chinese medicine from the academic point of view. A lot of the terminology and words and stuff I was already familiar with, but I learned the stuff from doing it hands-on. I didn't learn it from a book or someone standing up like doing it this way. I actually learned it with people and we twisted each other's wrist to feel it and massage each other's nose so that they passed out or woke up. So I've lived it. Not everybody has the benefit of doing that these days. So this is great. You know, University Club, you know, you're offering opportunities for people to keep learning all different things. I could do this probably every week, a different topic. Acupressure one week, acupuncture, the moxibustion, that's just all that stuff. Deep breathing exercises, knee exercises, back exercises, exercises for balance, exercises for strength, exercises before surgery, exercises for after surgery. So the point I'm getting at is I am a resource that's available if you folks need it, you know, find me. Because when I'm gone, I don't want it just to evaporate. So there's so much information out there right now between YouTube and books and that, but if you don't know what you're looking for, then it's just, you know, I can walk in that library over there and there's tons of books and stuff, but unless it's something that I know I need, you know, I, I, I don't know, you got thousands of books there. So if you don't know like what you're looking for as far as, you know, alternative health or different ways to, you know, take your, your uh, health care program into your own hands, if you don't know how to do it, you got to find someone that does. And that's what I've been doing. So. So hopefully if you enjoyed this, you'll you know, come to one of my classes. If you didn't enjoy it, let me know why. But you know, I can talk. If anybody wants to stay after, you know, we can still go over some stuff. But we said we'd go until about 3.15. Well, I've been wrong, so I'm to look at your oh, yeah, take a glance. Again, this will just give you a little bit more of an idea what, you know, what else, what other stuff is out there. So thanks for coming. Hope you enjoyed it. Thank you so much, Jim. So. Uh, Jim has a YouTube channel, Mind and Body. Uh,
I have to probably give you some information how to find it because you know, if you search my name on YouTube, then you'll find me, but you gotta know how to spell my name. So you gotta find something on the table here that's got my name on it. So most of you probably have a phone, cell phone, you can take a picture, you can contact find my me. website. So if everybody has my email, you can contact me, I'll give you a link to it. There's, there's ways to find me if you need to.